Good morning from sunny Oslo. I'm in Norway. It's actually about 10 o'clock in the morning. The sun came up uh, around 9.15. It's the interesting thing about these northern climes. Well, we continue our Sermon on the Mount series today looking at what Jesus said about lust and also briefly what he said about divorce. So we're in Matthew 5. I'm going to read now verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for it to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. These are some of the strongest words in the entire New Testament. You know, the New Testament only has a few passages on hell, and they're normally the words of Jesus. We should pay attention here. Now, although this is a uh, talk on lust, lust is not just a sexual thing. Now, in this passage it is. He's talking about a lust that uh, leads to adultery. But there are different kinds of lust, even lust for possessions and uh, pride and reputation and honor, those kinds of things. And First John chapter 2, 15 to 17, explains that kind of lust. But lust is the evil root from which the bitter fruit of adultery grows. Now, look, I know this passage is strong, and I've never met anyone who has cut off his hand or removed his eye because of lust, though I've heard of it happening. I just don't know anyone directly who's uh, done that literally obeying Jesus. I don't think we should literally obey him here because I think this is a figure of speech. And there are many passages in the Sermon on the Mount that have that quality, that are they're overstated, like pray only inside in your closet so no one can see. Well, Jesus prayed all over the place, right? But it's the attitude we're talking about. So there is an element of overstatement. That does not mean we don't take Jesus seriously. The early church, that is in the first few hundred years, fought for the faith. And they were in a sexually saturated society. What was, what was there in the first century? And the following, pornography, prostitution, theater, art, baths, orgies, dinner parties, sex with slaves, homosexuality, pederasty, bestiality, people having mistresses, uh, X-rated poetry, <laughs> and much more. So I, I know we're in a very sex-saturated society now, but they were then as well. In the words of Athenagoras, one of the early Christian leaders, we are so far from practicing promiscuous intercourse that it's unlawful among us even to indulge a lustful look. So the Christians said, we don't do that. You know, we're faithful to our wives. It's wrong to even look. Such an attitude was as rare back then as it is today. What do we do? Uh, three solutions, and maybe more, uh, emerge from this passage. Solution one, do not look at indecently dressed persons. If I meet someone like this on the street, if we're interacting, I just look in the person's eyes. If not, I just look above them. Well, that's easy for me because I'm taller than a lot of people. Uh, but you look to the side, but you don't look. Just like today, ancient theaters and spectacles were typically indecent. Avoid indecent shows. That is the theaters and the ceremonies of the pagans. That's an attitude from the early church and the apostolic constitutions. Now, that's not the word of God. I don't think the word of God says you can't go to the theater, but very often many shows Christians should not be at. Uh, uh, can we agree on that? Tertullian writes, are we not commanded to put away from us all immodesty? On this ground, we're excluded from the theater, which is immodesty's own peculiar home. Is it right to look on what it is disgraceful to do? How is it that the things that defile a man and going out of his mouth are not regarding as doing so when they go into his eyes and ears? And one more novation of Rome. I'm ashamed to talk about the things that are said on the stage. In fact, I'm even ashamed to denounce the things that are done, the tricks of arguments, the cheating of adulterers, the immodesty of women, the indecent jokes. 
So Jesus may have overstated for effect the literary device called hyperbole, but he was understood very well. Now, the Christians weren't cutting out their eyeballs with a grapefruit spoon, but they did stay away from places of temptation. Solution one, don't look at indecently dressed persons. Solution two, avoid obscene talk. Talking about the opposite sex in a sensual or obscene matter easily leads to lust. Ephesians 5, verses 3 and 4. Some versions say, let there not be a hint of sexual immorality among you. That's a paraphrase. What it actually says is it shouldn't even be named among you. That means it shouldn't happen among you, but even to talk about it can be hard. Let's go to another early Christian source. A Christian who is faithful should neither repeat a pagan hymn nor sing an obscene song. These days, we don't have many songs honoring pagan gods. <laughs> Maybe there's some like My Sweet Lord, but normally it's the so-called explicit lyrics. Of course, all, this, all lyrics can be explicit, but we know what that means. They're talking about something that's explicitly uh, profanity. Do we listen to songs like that? Or worse, do we listen to songs like that with the profanity beeped out? Because <laughs> then it reminds you of what the missing word is. And now you know the word. You've thought about it even more than if you just heard it. Avoid obscene talk. And solution three, dress and behave modestly. Modesty, of course, is much more than um, not exposing or exhibiting parts of our body. I mean, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. People will see our bodies. That's one reason that we should be in control and be temperate. And, but it's much more than that. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.9 speaks of modesty uh, involving what we do with our hair or jewelry or things like that. And, of course, what's obscene in one society may be the norm in another. And we have to discern, is that bad or is that neutral? And I'm not here to try to uh, explain all that here. But obscenity can pertain to the, the cost of certain items that we have. We're living in luxury. A price tag can be obscene. We, we hear this, you know, obscene, like incredibly expensive. How can you spend that much money when people are starving? So modesty is much more than just sexual chastity. And also, uh, I think it should be said that true beauty is something that's inward. Peter says that in 1 Peter 3.3. 3. Well, Clement of Alexandria, and then we're going to look at Tertullian, uh, two uh, church leaders uh, in uh, Africa. Clement said, on the one hand, we, we must keep from exhibiting and exposing parts of the body that we should not exhibit. On the other hand, we must keep from looking at what is forbidden. So it's not just the looking that's the problem. It's causing other people to stumble. And then Tertullian, see how many women there are who earnestly desire to look pleasing even to strangers. On that very account, she takes care to have herself painted out. Yet denying that she has ever been an object of carnal appetite, why therefore excite toward yourself evil passion? Why invite the very thing to which you profess yourself a stranger? Are we, that is, we're, we're saying that we have nothing to do with uh, immorality. We don't even get close. So why are we tempting people? Are we to paint ourselves out so that our neighbors may perish? Understanding paint is referring to makeup here. What happened to the words, love your neighbors yourself? And so it could be viewed as an implementation of the second greatest commandment that men and women dressed modestly. We're modest in our speech, in our habits, our diet, our clothing, our lifestyle. Does that make sense? I think it's amazing. So that's the warning in uh, Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Now, there is also a section on divorce, uh, which I will, I'll just give you the one minute summary of that. If you want to, because it's a very uh, compl complex issue, and I've got a five part, five talks with notes on that subject, which you can link to if you like. But in brief, in the Jewish world, there were grounds for divorce beside adultery. And yet most people in Jesus' day had a, I guess you could call it a no-fault divorce, 
uh, really an any cause divorce. I think that's the actual phrase they used, any cause. But biblically, the grounds included failure to provide food and clothing for one spouse, failure to offer love, conjugal love, sexual love, and obviously adultery, uh, desertion. So the rabbis understood that to be the case because of Exodus 21, 10 and 11, and other passages. So even though there were multiple grounds for divorce, by Jesus' day, it was much more popular just to divorce without specifying any issue. When the Pharisees asked Jesus about divorce in Matthew 19, they're asking which side of the debate he was on, just cause or any cause. Can you divorce your wife for any reason? Or does there have to be you know, a reason, like adultery, which I think refers to more than just a sexual thing? Most Jews practice the easy, any cause divorce, right? So there's multiple grounds. In my understanding of the Bible, there still are multiple grounds. Basically, if we uh, violate our wedding vows, that's grounds for divorce. Not that we should divorce, but it's grounds. So let's keep our marital vows if we're married, right? So I'm not going to say anything more there, but Jesus is very strong in what he says. And I think uh, it's hard for us to understand the context with about, without some background. And I hope I provided that for you in my series. Let's sum up what we've looked at. Let's refuse to look at immodestly dressed persons. And obviously, that's people not just on the street, it's people on the screen. This has many implications for parties, fashion, television viewing, movies, going to the beach, and so forth. And I was at a party last night here in Norway. It was a Christmas party. Everyone was modest. And not just modestly dressed, modestly speaking. Uh, the group was largely Christian. That's probably why, although there were, there were a few dozen guests as well. But a party is a better party without the immodesty, without the, the drugs and the alcohol and the lewd dancing and everything. As implications for fashion, and not just how we dress, but if you're someone who keeps up with fashion, I'm not, but should we honor or be supportive of styles that are risque? You know, what we look at on the screen, going to the beach. I, I've known brothers who think, I just, I don't go to the beach. Because in my country, the women wear so little, it's very hard to stum to to look without stumbling. I mean, it you, depends how busy the beach is too. I guess if you're the only one there, no problem. But even that may seem extreme, but it's the kind of decision we should be willing uh, to make uh, to take Jesus seriously. Also, let's have nothing to do with obscene talk. And don't say, well, I'm not affected by the words. We're all affected by the words. Words affect us. And let's live modestly in our behavior, our standard of living, and even how we dress. We don't want to cause other people to stumble. If you're married, take your marriage vows seriously. And last, let's not be overconfident. Remember this, lust destroyed, it undid. Lust brought down the strongest man, the purest man, and the wisest man. The strongest man, Samson, purest man, David, the wisest man, Solomon. Lust undid the strongest man, the purest man, the wisest man. Let's not overestimate our strength. Let's follow the Lord in his instructions here. Next time, we'll be looking at oaths, taking oaths, and also non-resistance, which is a big topic in early church, and we'll uh, also be focused on in the following talk. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Bye for now.